Welcome everyone to the Social Green final event about combating energy poverty in times of crisis, an interregional dialogue on building resilience. My name is Johannes Liedmo, and I am a research fellow at Nojegu, who is the lead partner of the Social Green project. I'm also the project coordinator of Social Green Consortium. Today, I will moderate the, today's final event, and I will now start sharing some of my slides. Let's see if this works. We have a, as you can see, a new studio here at Nodrego, so I'm getting a bit used to, to this. Let's see. Uh, can you see this now? Um, yeah. Yeah. Now it should work. Perfect. So. Uh, the Social Green Project, uh, sorry, I just need to move this, uh, is really about the intersection of society and environment. This means that we view housing as a social space, as built infrastructure and centers of energy and resource consumption. It also means that we see the social implication of green buildings um, at a global scale through the environment and sustainability, and at a local scale, through the well-being of residents. The Social Green Project has existed in two rounds, basically. Um, the Social Green Project was initially a first call into a Europe project, and it started back in 2016. Back then, we focused on improving, improving regional policy instruments by targeting the link between green building, social housing, and energy poverty. We did so through several interregional learning activities, such as study visits, project meetings, attending conferences, self-assessments, and so on. In the spring 2021, uh, basically when the Social Green project had ended, we had a chance to apply for another year of Interreg Europe's fifth call activities, of which actually four of our regional partners, plus us at Nodregio, continued for another year. This has had a similar focus in the final year, but it has been put into a context of COVID-19. This has meant that we have focused on challenges that have appeared or become more prominent in the field of combating energy poverty during the pandemic. The playing field has changed since the Social Green Project actually started. As you know, we got the COVID-19 pandemic, which this uh, fifth caller activities has been about. But now with the war in Ukraine, we have also seen increased energy prices in Europe. So the past year, when this project has been conducted, the fifth call activities, we have conducted three interregional seminars, had local stakeholder group meetings, and collected good practices, and done actually a two-step self-assessment. So this is a map showing all the partners in the Social Green project. Uh, in the initial project, the, pro uh, the consortium consisted of eight partners, of which uh, one is an advisory lead partner, which is us at Nodregu. Uh, in the final year uh, of the fifth call activities, Social Green has consisted of four regional partners plus us at Nodrego. And as you can see on the, on the map here, they are marked with red. So this is the today's program of our final event, and it's divided into three sections, and it includes the following. We will start with key takeaways from the Social Green Project final report. Then we will continue with the Social Green partners who will go more into depth to provide their key, key takeaways from their final year. We have also invited Dr. Saskia Petrova, who actually is doing research on energy poverty. She will present some of her research and she will also participate in the panel discussion together with our partners, where we together will discuss how we can become more resilient due to the increasing vulnerability we have seen in the past year. So in case you have any questions to the speakers, please post your questions in the chat. In the panel discussion later on, some of your questions might be asked. I will now stop sharing my screen, see how this works. Um, stop share. Yes. So I will now introduce my colleague, Lisa Rower, who is a junior research fellow here at Nodregio and has been the main author of the Social Green Final Report. Yes, exactly. Thank the floor you, is Johannes. Yours. Thank you. And it's great to be with all of you today. Um, as Johanna said, I am a, research, a junior research fellow here at Nodregio, and I've been working with the Social Green Project since the fifth call activities began uh, last September. So um, it's great to be here, and I will start sharing my slides as well now.
Good, they should be viewable by everyone. Fantastic. Oh. Here we are. Thank you. Okay. Two and a half years into this, we would think we've gotten the hang of it now, but not quite yet. Here we go. Fantastic. Thank you all for your patience. So this report is a culmination of the work that took place during the past year of the Social Grain Project. And in this presentation, I will provide an overview of these findings. But first, a brief background on our topic. As Johannes introduced, the Social Green Project is interested in tackling energy poverty in social housing. Energy poverty can be described as when a household is unable to secure a level and quality of domestic energy services sufficient for its social and material needs. And importantly, energy poverty has major social, economic, and environmental implications. According to the European Commission's Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, about 50 million people in the EU experience energy poverty. And this means that around 10% of the EU population suffers from the high cost of energy bills to the extent that it interferes with their physical or mental well being. And often the predicament of energy poverty is due to the conditions of older housing stock throughout Europe, particularly in the social housing sector. In the EU, 75% of the building stock is considered energy inefficient. In addition to the social impact of energy poverty, buildings are responsible for 40% of energy consumption in the EU and contribute to 36% of carbon emissions. And as we all know, Europe is facing a dramatic energy crisis at the moment. According to the Household Energy Price Index, in the past 12 months, electricity bills have increased by 54% in EU capital cities, and gas bills have increased by 110%. This means that the estimated number of people suffering from energy poverty has likely increased as well. Those living in energy poverty often suffer from a twofold problem. Firstly, they suffer from insufficient heating or electrical systems that burn energy at an inefficient rate. And secondly, they suffer from extreme costs associated with energy consumption. Unfortunately, studies show that vulnerable households have been most affected by the pandemic with regards to energy poverty. Therefore, improving energy efficiency is a climate issue as well as a social justice issue. Rather than merely sub subsidizing costs to pay for energy systems, green retrofits replace inefficient systems with more sustainable and cost-effective solutions. And regional and local authorities, as well as energy agencies, are key actors in this work. Social Green is made up of several such authorities and agencies. In an interregional meeting during this past year, we asked our partners what words they would use to describe the current social housing situation in their regions. And as you can see, the main takeaways are that the situation is challenging, that current measures are insufficient, and that there's still more to do. So throughout the course of this year, we found that there were many commonalities as well as distinctions among our partners. And during several workshops, six key messages emerged. Firstly, all Social Green partners indicated that existing structures are significant to the work of energy retrofits. For example, in Sudmontania, one municipality is already using solar panels and heat pumps for social housing. In Extremadura, energy technology has also already been developed. Many partners have strong administrative capacities that help authorities access funding for retrofit work. Importantly, all four localities in the Social Green project currently have a high need for energy renovation projects. In Croatia, more than half of the buildings require renovations, while in Extremadura, around 80% of housing stock is considered inefficient. In Sudmontania, the percentage is close to 90. This is due to old housing built using inefficient materials and equipped with unsustainable energy systems, and it applies to both public and private housing. The practical application of transforming housing to become more energy efficient requires specific competencies that are not always available. Many regional governments have experienced coordinating social housing efforts, but the lack of specialized labor for building renovations or renewable resource installation has led to a gap between planning and implementation. Several partners further indicated that the lack of involvement, interest, or skills in energy renovations from the private sector leaves the issue to be addressed by the public sector alone. And the pandemic has only exacerbated this issue. Some partners share the challenge of tenant skepticism when it comes to addressing energy inefficiency. 
tenants in some countries often lack confidence in or express direct pushback against public administration. Representatives from Albiulia noted that in private housing, completing energy retrofits is nearly impossible due to the inability to gain citizen approval. And this happens even when the renovation program covers most of the costs to conduct the renovation. Some partners also noted additional tenant concerns, such as the misuse of housing facilities and, of course, the difficulties they have with paying rent or energy bills. The COVID-19 pandemic has had several consequences on improving energy efficiency in social housing. Firstly, the pandemic has caused major delays in retrofit work. Secondly, as countries recover from the pandemic, increased electricity and gas prices are having tremendous effects on citizens. In some regions, so much so that it is hard to identify who is not considered vulnerable. All of the partners have experienced an increase in construction prices and household energy costs in their regions. But despite the consequences of price hikes, the pandemic has also shed light on the insufficiency of existing systems and provided a new wave of interest in and additional financing schemes to address this widespread problem. For example, in Extremadura, EU funds from the Recovery, Transformation and Resilience Plan have been allocated for the construction of energy efficient social housing. Yet some regions are hindered by the short period of time allotted for executing projects supported by such funds. Financial investment in energy retrofit work is a clear need, but making these funds accessible to provide for those most in need can be a challenge. One strength for Albiulia is that clear targets and priorities exist, which make it possible for grants to be appropriately accessed. Meanwhile, Rayon identified finances as a key weakness in their work due to the lack of sufficient funding and eligibility restrictions. Sudmontania also noted that the process of applying for funding and collecting appropriate documentation from tenant associations makes funding cumbersome. The economic situation has also changed dramatically over the course of the year due to the war in Ukraine and the growing global energy demand as countries emerge from the pandemic. All of the partners have indicated growing concerns due to these ongoing crises. Finally, legislation acts as a barrier when policies are not comprehensive or involve complex systems for achieving their goals. For example, the program with which Rayon has worked specifically targets homes that are, not, that are owned, not rented. Therefore, the program intrinsically excludes some of the most vulnerable citizens from participating. Albiulia also noted that the threat of a fluctuating national legislative environment creates low predictability and makes planning difficult at the municipal level. Still, some legislation has improved in recent years, thanks to EU directives. The pandemic revealed large scale vulnerability, while the energy crisis in Europe evolved and exacerbated the situation. This past year, the Social Green Partners have identified several hindrances to energy retrofitting of social housing, but the knowledge exchange among partners has also fostered a dialogue on existing solutions. And furthermore, such interregional discussions have supported the identification of future efforts. These include using crises as an opportunity to describe renovation benefits to skeptical tenants and establishing appropriate frameworks that define energy poverty in a clear and inclusive manner. Such pathways from problem to action are paramount to combat existing challenges and build resilience for the future. Thank you. And now I will give the floor back to Johannes and stop sharing my screen here. Johannes, yes. thanks. Thank you, Lisa, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, the final report will be published quite soon on the Social yes. Green website, yes. right? Later this week. So. Yeah, yeah. So you will find it on the Social Green website later on. Uh, so we will now go to the next session of the Social Green uh, final event, and I'm going, which is actually about the, we will invite all our regional partners, and it will be about the key takeaways in the, from the fifth call activities of the Social Green project. Our first speaker is Andrew Jorgosko. He works at the Regional Development Agency Sud Montania in Romania. He will present the challenges regarding energy poverty during the pandemic in the South Montania region. So welcome, Andrew, and please go ahead. Hello. Nice to meet you all. I start my presentation now. Okay.
combating in, uh, energy poverty in times of crisis. I have a small presentation about this. Main challenges uh, with energy poverty during the pandemic. The price of uh, construction materials increased very much and uh, quickly. Workers were uh, more and more difficult to find. The ongoing uh, projects were delayed due to the illness of the workers. The population and governments uh, had less and less money to invest in retrofit. The, tea, the key takeaways from uh, the one year extension of our uh, project. Our key takeaway from uh, this project period about uh, pertaining to fighting um, energy poverty uh, is that the Social Green Project has uh, provided the opportunity to identify and understand better uh, the necessity and ways uh, of supporting people belonging to vulnerable groups in order to surpass the COVID-19 uh, crisis and uh, actual context related to rising prices in energy sector. The most important thing uh, is to support the projects that aims to increase energy efficiency in the social housing sector and the, uh, in the use of renewable energy source to fight energy poverty. How we will improve our policy instrument? Uh, SMFDA, um, address in Romania, uh, plan to improve our aid, uh, our RDP by using the international uh, learning activities and good practice identification methods in order to update the content of the PA with measures that address reducing energy poverty and uh, responded to the social impacts of COVID-19. By the end of the project, we will improve the policy instrument with measures that support uh, the increase of the energy efficiency, especially in communities affected by energy poverty. Thus, in, the, in terms of the efficiency of energy consumption, the new RDP is addressing this issue, uh, issue by supporting uh, the renovation carried out uh, with priority to social housing. Also, the new ROP uh, 2021-2027 of the sub montania region will contain an indicative action aiming to support investments in the resi residential buildings, including individual and social housing, in order to ensure uh, improve energy efficiency, including consolidation activities according to identified risks and for the use of alternative energy sources. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have some question. Um, thank you, Andre. I think uh, if we have any questions, please post them in the chat and, and we'll bring them up into the panel discussion. Um, it was uh, very interesting to see your, hear about your key takeaways from, from the final year. We will now move on to our next speaker, which is Anna Martinez. And she works at Agenex, which is Extremadura Energy Agency in Spain. She will present about the recovery funds, an opportunity to boost the energy renovation process in the Extremadura region. So welcome, Anna, and please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. He was very quick. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I am Ana Martinez, as uh, Johannes said, uh, from Consortium Extremadura Energy Agency, and I will try to show you what are the challenges that we are facing regarding energy poverty in Extremadura region in Spain. Um, the title of the, the presentation is Recovery Funds as an Opportunity to Boost the Energy Renovation Process in Extremadura region. Uh, because we see that the, the energy crisis and the COVID-19 situation could be used as an opportunity to boost the, the energy renovation process, but also to reduce energy poverty. It, it's true that maybe has increased, but uh, we need to look for the solutions and try to sort the situation and take advantage of the, of the new measures and the, the new regulations that are in place right now. 
So regarding the challenges, um, as Lisa has commented in the in the um, report, uh, we have a reduction of uh, purchasing power of low-income families due to the economic crisis. So right now we have more families that need help. They they cannot afford their rent. They cannot afford to to buy a new home. Uh, but they are also they cannot afford to buy the the bills. So the energy bills. So this is one problem. The one, uh, another one that we have identified in the region is that uh, we have manpower shortage, uh, but this is also joined to the lack of capabilities in construction sector labor force uh, regarding energy efficiency measures, okay? Also, the recovery funds are an they are an opportunity because they focus on energy efficiency measures, uh, not only in social housing but also in all in, uh, in all housings, uh, where we also found vulnerable families. But uh, we have a short period to to execute them, so that is a huge challenge that we are facing right now. And then another difficulty is that um, uh, our um, the the, how, the, um, the public housing uh, here in Extremadura, the social housing that are owned by the go uh, regional government, are really easy um, to for implementing new actions like energy efficiency measures in them. But the problem that we are uh, that we have is that on these buildings we not only have tenants. The, of this public housing. We also have owners that with the years, they, they, they wanted to buy the house that they were renting. So right now these owners, they cannot afford uh, this measure that uh, maybe the administration want to be implemented. So it's quite challenging how to work on them. Then if we move on to the learnings from this call is that we have seen some examples uh, of energy efficiency and renewable energy sources measures that have been implemented in social housing uh, from our partners, uh, from RIAN uh, and, and SM, SMRDA. Uh, but the thing is, uh, we need to see how these measures can be implemented in our region. And we, we have tried to transfer the, this learning into, into our region. Uh, we have learned how to assess citizens and convince them about the energy efficiency renovation. We need to show them the benefits that they need to improve the, 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 and the, build, the performance, the energy performance of the buildings. So like that, we can also reduce uh, their consumption, but also their demand. So that is really important. Um, something that we share, but that, that we also learn from, is the Ravita program, which is the good practice that we share with the consortium, and it's a really interesting example to boost the to fix the population into the territory uh, and boost the energy re renovation of all empty houses because this program um, allows the possibility to um, for the empty houses of the region to be um, renovated by the administration and then in these uh, new buildings renovated uh, will be social housing to be rent so it is quite interesting how they have uh, approached this project so the pathway to the future uh, in our region, we are aiming to implement new project, uh, new renovation project of social housing or um, um, residential buildings where we have vulnerable situation. How? Um, assessing the regional government, um, uh, suggesting the most uh, cost-effective measure to be um, implemented in these uh, in these buildings, and also providing advice to citizens in order to um, execute the recovery funds uh, in the in the best uh, way and uh, help them in the application process. We. How are we going to do that? Uh, we have uh, one, a one-stop shop in place uh, where we are giving uh, we are um, giving a service uh, to the citizens, public administration, municipalities, of the different recovery funds or uh, grant programs that are available right now. We are also providing some energy studies to the regional government, suggesting uh, what is the potential savings of any uh, of energy efficiency measure, uh, what is the potential potential uh, energy reduction, but also what is the, the investment needed for them. 
we have the Rabita program. We are not, we are, the regional government is working in a housing plan. So we have the framework. Uh, we have the regional uh, recovery funds uh, here. Um, what we are going to try is with social green project learnings and with our uh, assistance to improve the situation in the region. So that's it from our side. Hope you, if you have any question, maybe we can address that in the panel. Yeah. Th thank you, Anna. I think I will keep to, to all the questions for the panel so we can move on. But it was very interesting to hear about the, the framework you have in place. It's just we need to, to get things down now so we are combating energy poverty. So thank you, Anna. We will now move on to our next uh, Social Green Regional Partner. We will actually go back to Romania. And it's Tudor Dambéran uh, who will who will be our next speaker. He works at Alba Iulia Municipalities. So he works at the most lowest level of government uh, in Romania. He will present about promoting the use of renewable energies to increase energy efficiency in the social housing sector. So welcome, Tudor. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Johannes, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today at this uh, final event of our project Social Green. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the implications of Alberta municipality and uh, the results of the second pilot action, uh, which was the promoting the use of renewable energies to increase energy efficiency in the social housing sector. Okay, we'll, we'll start uh, with the introduction of the project. Uh, this was already done. Uh, we're now in the fifth call uh, for additional activities related to COVID-19. And uh, we believe it was a very good uh, opportunity for us to, uh, to deliver some things, especially during this difficult time of the COVID period. Um, some of the partners have changed, but uh, nevertheless, the four groups stay the same and uh, we could implement uh, very well all, all our activities. The main focus for Abelia was to address the regional operational program and to try to influence this program uh, throughout the social green uh, project uh, whole duration uh, and including also in this uh, period of additional activities we try to influence the new regional operational program for the next uh, the next financial period uh, in order to address as well uh, the social housing and existing building stock with with uh, really targeted measures which could uh, ensure energy efficiency uh, measures all right, uh, some of the activities in this period included the uh, local stakeholder meetings where we presented uh, the project, we presented the results of the first pilot action, but also the, uh, the objectives of the second pilot action of Alba Iulia. And we had two of these meetings, of course, online, since the pandemic was still very uh, much enforced uh, in this period, and uh, which, of course, made some of our activities uh, quite difficult. Uh, since uh, 2020 and until present day. Uh, we've also uh, uh, uploaded a good practice on the, on the Social Green website uh, with one of our projects. Uh, it's a center for the er elderly in the city and uh, this has been renovated soon uh, with, uh, uh, with the renewable uh, sources of energy. And uh, this, uh, this will be a, a building that uh, will constitute a landmark uh, scalable at national level also for other municipalities uh, since a lot of its energy will be used from renewable sources especially during these times uh, it's quite encouraged uh, then we had the uh, two parts of assessment uh, which was uh, elaborated uh, by our team and uh, of course this was done in uh, partnership with the local stakeholders i won't go very much into details at this point uh, we had a first pilot action, which was implemented successfully and which was finalized uh, beginning of 2021. Um, and uh, quite happy uh, for all the beneficiaries, but also for us as administration. And the second uh, pilot action, uh, which was implemented in this period, it was uh, during this call for additional activities and where the municipality proposed the technical solutions at one of the buildings, of social housing buildings, to install uh, solar panels in order to, to reduce the dependency on uh, conventional heating um, and to introduce renewables as the uh, source for uh, 
for heating, for warm water, and eventually reducing the utility bills for the tenants living uh, in the building, which were uh, from vulnerable groups. Uh, we undertook all the necessary efforts, uh, contracted the company, which made a small expertise, and then began uh, began the implementation of the, of the technical solution. This was uh, obviously at no cost for the citizens, as this was all uh, uh, supported by the project and by the municipality. Going forward, uh, the, the, that's the general objective being to, as I said, to improve energy efficiency at local level uh, for, the, uh, for the building, excuse me, the technical issue and uh, to uh, well to reduce the dependency on conventional fuels to increase renewable sources of energy and to, to uh, support the, the persons most affected by the pandemic effects um, we've had uh, around uh, 25 apartments which were beneficiaries and uh, roughly 80 persons vulnerable persons living there um, this was also the site of the first pilot action, so it was quite a complementary measure. Uh, everyone being very happy about this, uh, uh, these measures that were implemented. And the indirect beneficiaries, of course, were uh, all the other housing members, uh, social housing uh, members from the central region level, because this measure could uh, be introduced uh, in the next regional operational program. Uh, by the managing authority, uh, so the results of the pilot action are quite relevant for these uh, future calls. Um, just a little bit about technical solutions, but again, I, I won't go into detail because there's not so much time. Uh, but it's important to say that it was quite a consistent uh, investment made uh, using uh, very professional uh, equipment, uh, top-notch equipment. Uh, that were uh, employed in order to, to ensure the success of this, uh, this solution proposed. Basically, the, the solar panels were existing for, for uh, the last 10 years, but they were not functioning. So we need a lot of new technical equipment to be installed in order to make these uh, solar panels effective again and to produce the change. Just uh, to show a little bit the uh, a software software model the energy consumption and the energy generated uh, by the uh, solar panels on a year scale okay and this uh, this would be a result from the 20th of uh, June until August and we can see in green the uh, the, the effects of uh, the solar panels and uh, we have uh, roughly an uh, estimation uh, of gas consumption reduction of 27 megawatts per year, which would translate in uh, an economy of about 2,400 euros per year. So it's it's quite uh, good if we think about the, the current uh, hikes and spikes of the energy uh, prices in Europe. Um, also, we, we uh, try to find out the, the people's uh, perception, the tenants' perception on this project, and we addressed a few questions for a questionnaire, and we had very good uh, responses, since they, they all considered it was a very good uh, idea, of course, uh, and they had even a very good estimation of uh, how much energy was reduced in their electricity and gas bill due to the measures installed. And, uh, it, it was quite satisfying to see the people agreed uh, to, to these measures because, of course, it's very important to get their consent and to get their approval of these measures. Okay, just uh, some of the conclusions and to finalize, uh, it's very important to plan in advance uh, such, uh, such measures, uh, such technical measures, and you need the right approach also with the tenants and the tenants association, but also with uh, to, to, to contract the right company, which can understand what the technical solution is needed and to, to uh, make the operation as smooth as possible and uh, using the most advanced techniques. Um, for, uh, for us, it was quite surprising to see the results, the economy results of the project and uh, to see some of the benefit, direct benefit from the first day of operation. So this is also one of the major advantages that you have results from day, day one of installing this uh, equipment. 
And uh, we've had, uh, well, uh, an estimation that uh, the solar panel can uh, do up to 33 savings, uh, 33 percentage of savings uh, during the whole year. And in the summer, it's almost 50 percent. So that's quite uh, an effective result. Um, and uh, we, we consider that such uh, conclusions could be, uh, such measures could be included in the future ROP given the results and uh, the, the direct beneficiaries uh, would be the most important to, to reach out to and to support with these measures. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you to your very, very interesting presentation. I just have one question. I said that we will take everything to the panel session, but it's, I mean, in, in the previous social green and in the current extension in the fifth quarter, so you have had pilot actions uh, and you have learned a lot and you try to influence your regional operation program through the learnings from your pilot actions. This last one with the, with the solar panel installations and so on, have you, will there be any ways for us who are not in Romania to, to learn from, from your pilot action? Will there be published publications or some information somewhere available? Yes, we will publish the final report, which will be in English on the municipality's website, and of course it will be available for anyone to download and to see yeah. the results. Uh, it's already finalized and uh, we will be able to share yeah. it there with uh, all partners and all, all relevant municipalities who are interested in such a measure. Yeah, I think many are interested in, 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 in the lessons learned from your pilot action particularly. Thank you very much, Shudo. We will take the rest of the questions uh, in the panel session. Um, actually, normally we are uh, behind this time schedule. Now it seems we are a bit ahead of time schedule. That's that's perfect. I will. We will actually move to our final uh, social green partner. Uh, it's Ivan Simic, who works at the Regional Energy Agency North in Croatia. And actually, in in in, in your region, you have also have a, had a similar uh, pilot. Um, product going on, or you have worked with solar panels at least. So he will present the role of solar PV in reducing the risk of energy poverty. So welcome, Ivan, and please go ahead. Thank you, Johannes. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, as Johannes said, I will represent the Green Regional Energy Agency North uh, and uh, more over the pilot project that we have, that we have uh, conducted throughout the project. So um, we have called this presentation the role of solar PV in reducing the risk of energy poverty, uh, mainly due to the focus that we uh, wanted to uh, dedicate our time uh, during this one year of, of the project. Uh, as briefly to the content, uh, we are going to explain uh, the basics of energy poverty in Croatia. How was the response from uh, the national program, uh, which is an example of a good practice. And then we will move on to our uh, pilot project, uh, which is called the solar potential map. Uh, how are we uh, working with the ministry and uh, other stakeholder uh, group members uh, to propose uh, the new measure? And what have you learned uh, in the last year? So regarding the energy poverty, um, these are the statistical data, which uh, probably are not uh, relevant anymore due to uh, yeah, the economic crisis and uh, already mentioned uh, political crisis uh, in Europe. So uh, as, as you can see, there's still no definition of energy poverty and the exact number of people living in energy poverty. And uh, as I said, the COVID-19, uh, pandemic, the political and economic turmoils in Europe have caused the increase in energy prices, which uh, obviously inf implies uh, some, uh, I would say, unwanted effects, uh, namely inflation, uh, further increase in the number of vulnerable citizens. Uh, what was the response uh, to uh, the main response to the to the energy poverty uh, actually took place in uh, 2020? Uh, so during the first part of the project, we have extensively worked with a responsible ministry and other stakeholders uh, on the uh, definition of the national program of renovation of 
The family house is uh, owned uh, by the citizens in the risk of energy poverty. Um, the main information you can see more than 4 million euros was committed to the first call uh, that was published in, in 2020. Uh, this was financed mainly from the sales of emission allowances, uh, which were at that time at the level of 20 to 25 euros per, per ton now, uh, although uh, they have uh, been um, yeah, uh, raising until 1995. Now they have been a bit uh, less expensive uh, and uh, this was the primary source of the finances so these were the mainly uh, national sources not mainly but primarily main uh, national sources for the financing of this uh, program and uh, uh, there was a plan for the 160 renovations um, what we have uh, posed in the question uh, during and after after the Call was how to improve this program. Uh, can we perhaps uh, enrich this program with additional measures, uh, especially meaning, uh, especially considering the solar PV installations on, on energy poor family houses? Uh, and uh, as Johannes said, uh, we have also been considering uh, the COVID 19 pandemic relief uh, measures and how to combine those two. Uh, and we have uh, come up with uh, the pilot project that uh, we have called the solar potential uh, map. So, uh, as I said, uh, we wanted to cover both the energy poverty, address the energy poverty and uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, what we wanted is uh, to, uh, let's say enable uh, not only uh, the energy poor citizens, but also all citizens of the city of Varazin, which is our uh, associated partner on this project. Uh, and we wanted uh, that this map provides an initial information on the optimal size of the PV installation. Uh, we wanted this uh, map to be simple to use. We want it to be scalable to all buildings. And we wanted uh, to get an additional insight into the energy poor households. Uh, in general, energy poor uh, the, the data from energy poor households is something that is uh, quite difficult to obtain. And uh, we have also uh, learned this throughout, throughout this project as well. So uh, I will just briefly introduce uh, the main functionality of, of this uh, solar potential map. Uh, later on, uh, we can, throughout this panel discussion, we can maybe provide more details about this. So uh, what we have done uh, is actually uh, really made it uh, simple. Uh, there's only two steps that uh, the, the user is required to do. Uh, one is uh, to select the building on this online solution. Uh, this is really easily uh, obtained either via address or uh, scrolling on the map and finding the roof of your of your building. And then step two, input the monthly electricity cost. Uh, uh, behind, the, uh, behind this was an algorithm that was uh, developed by our colleagues. And uh, the results uh, uh, are, are really uh, easy to easy to read. Uh, the user gets the recommended power of, of its uh, PV plant that can be installed on, on the on the roof of its uh, or his uh, family house or uh, building. Uh, then you get the investment size, uh, which is um, regularly updated. Uh, due to the constant changes of uh, prices in materials and equipment. Uh, there's also um, an option uh, where you actually get the information uh, on how much you could get the subsidy from the National Environmental Protection Fund, which subsidizes uh, such systems with uh, 40 to 80%, depending on, on the region that is uh, from which um, the user or the, the, the citizen comes. 
so uh, in case of in case of virus, then this is this is forty percent. So we also gave this information to 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 the citizens. Um, what else did we what else did we also provide is uh, the return or the payback period time uh, the total cost of ownership etc cetera, etc cetera. and some interesting facts about the potential of reducing the the carbon footprint um, so uh, in parallel uh, we have been working on uh, the proposal of the new of the new measure um, so what we have done is uh, identify the citizens in the city of Varaždin, uh, which belong to the energy poor, uh, let's say, category. Uh, we have done the preliminary analysis using the tool developed in the project. So uh, based on the addresses that we have got from uh, our associate department, uh, city of Varaždin, we have uh, identified uh, the objects uh, uh, try to uh, briefly assess the, the potential. Then we have uh, conducted the on-site visits and surveys. So meet those people, uh, talk to them, uh, collect the data. Um, in general, energy poverty is, uh, and data regarding energy poverty is quite, um, let's say, um, difficult to obtain. Um, although this, Pilot project is an online tool, and although uh, many of these people do have uh, an access to, to to the internet, some of them don't, and uh, we definitely wanted to to meet those people and and see uh, uh, for the for ourselves uh, or, and collect the data that uh, is relevant for us. Uh, we have then uh, modeled the PV installations that could be installed on their roofs, on the on the roofs of their uh, family houses. Uh, in addition, uh, as we have, uh, if, as we have uh, since the launch of the, uh, the potential solar potential map in in March, we have uh, been asked by numerous times by the citizens of Varaždin, uh, and uh, we actually have done uh, more analysis on, uh, let's say, normal uh, households. So we have also done the comparison of the, the energy poor and, and normal households. To get the final results, which we will, uh, um, let's say, uh, embed into the proposal of a new measure and uh, discuss uh, this uh, proposal with uh, uh, both local stakeholder groups, as well as uh, the responsible ministry for, for the national program of the uh, energy renovation. Uh, we have further done uh, to be, let's say, more persuasive because we are working on the national level. We have done the estimation on the national level. So uh, we ask ourselves what would happen if, if solar PVs were installed on, on all the houses of people living in energy poverty in Croatia. Uh, I don't want to bother you with, with numbers, but uh, these are the numbers that are definitely something that is worth to, to, to the responsible ministry because they are working on the national level. Uh, and uh, we uh, thought that this would be also a good argument uh, in the discussion in discussion with them. Um, additional benefits uh, throughout the project uh, in the cooperation with, with our associated partner and one of our co-founding cities, City of Parajden, we have been working on the further development of the local policy instruments. Uh, so the city of Varaždin decided uh, to support citizens, uh, not only uh, those in uh, energy poor, but also uh, let's call them norm the normal citizens uh, with the free of charge technical support uh, to the citizens and other stakeholders. This is mainly uh, obviously uh, directed towards uh, the COVID pandemic and and how to how to actually um, the let's say the to, to initiate the investments uh, the energy crisis of course um, added to to the problem so uh, throughout uh, this last couple of months so that was uh, four uh, eight, five months we have helped more than uh, two hundred citizens to start the process of PV installation. Uh, uh, the city has decided to um, further 
uh, help uh, citizens with uh, support in co-financing the technical documentations for the PV installation. This policy instrument is to be started uh, probably in, in uh, fourth quarter of 2022, so this year. Uh, what we are quite proud of uh, and which uh, was, was actually that, uh, so we have nominated this pilot project solution uh, to a national uh, award uh, from the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development and the City of Waters did want the Green Prix, Green Prix 2022 uh, award uh, for the uh, best project initiated by the local authorities. And uh, on top of this, uh, after the launch of, of this uh, pilot project solution, uh, other cities in Croatia quickly ensued on, on this project. One of them is, is uh, the capital city of Zagreb, which introduced this uh, solution in uh, uh, late July, August. So we are, we are quite proud of uh, this dimension of, of, of the project as well. Uh, so what we have learned uh, in the last year, of course, not only uh, from our stakeholders, but also from our partners, uh, we have, we have uh, learned the importance of uh, knowledge sharing between partners and local stakeholders group. We always learn something, I have to say, uh, once you start uh, working on such a project and it's, and it's already uh, in, in its fifth year, uh, we, we definitely uh, learn something every time. Uh, we meet every time we uh, look at the good examples uh, locally, we have uh, learned about the problem uh, and uh, how to cope with the problem of the lack of information. How important is it is to see the real situation in which energy poor citizens live. This is what we have done, uh, as I said, with our on-site visits. Uh, we have been able to discuss with them how can we help them uh, with the let's say alternative solutions for uh, green solutions for, for both social housing as well as uh, houses owned by energy poor citizens. And um, of course, uh, with uh, this dimension of uh, helping uh, other citizens, we have learned how to, how uh, these this kind of problems can um, uh, actually attribute to more resilience uh, in the crisis. So um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to uh, the questions on the panel discussions. Yeah. Uh, back to Johannes. Thank you very much, Ivan. I just, since we have a bit of time, I just have one question to you. You, you said that in, in your, um, that you don't have a definition of energy poverty in Croatia, what's in one of your previous slides. And I think we have, we don't have it in all of Europe in general, like one, one universal definition. And we also in the social green project discussed what is social housing in the very beginning. And there's also no universal definition of what we mean by that. With that said, you also had done calculations for if you would install solar panels for all in, in all energy poor homes. Like how did, what was the definition of energy poor homes in your calculations then when you were doing that? Well, we actually uh, do the extrapolation and extrapolation is always, you know, <clears throat> can, can uh, miss the target, but uh, uh, we have the data on uh, the, so we have the number of, of people that receive uh, a so-called voucher for the electricity. Mm. So this was, this, was, this was the basis. Of course, we have then uh, uh, used other data uh, to make this ext extrapolation. And uh, yes, as I said, uh, this of course can miss the target, uh, mm. but this is something that we wanted to, you know, uh, we use the data from the city of Varaždin. So yep. they have, they have, the, they have uh, quite substantial a list of, of the users of, of the some kind of social fair services. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in discussion with them, with our local stakeholder group, we actually uh, tried to see uh, how big is the sample size. So what sample size should we use from the, the, above, from the, the, the whole uh, set of people of uh, living in, in, in or getting some kind of uh, social relief, 
uh, discussed mm -hmm. with them in our internal meetings with them. And uh, this is these are the assumptions that we used uh, for this okay. uh, relation. So as I said, of course, this can be uh, this can miss the target. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, uh, what we have done on the size of the sample in the city of Varaždin, uh, we think this uh, this can be a good sample if someone else wants to use it for further for further uh, analysis. Yeah, yeah, that's why we do pilot projects. I think to 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 come up with new ways of of, of working. Thank you, Ivan. We will now move on to the next section of, of the final event of Social Green, which is about building resilience while combating energy poverty in Europe. And we have invited a, a researcher from, from University of Manchester, Dr. Saskia Petrova, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. Uh, and she is, for example, researching energy poverty. So we have asked Saskia to in a pre presentation reflect upon first, the vulnerability of energy poor households in terms of crisis. And secondly, your reflections on building resilience while combating energy poverty in Europe. So welcome Saskia and please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. At least it's still it's still morning here in the UK. Uh, thank you for inviting me once again to join to join one of the uh, one of the events uh, of the project. And thank you, especially Johannes, for you know giving me um, an opportunity to get involved and to hear more about those fascinating pilot projects and some of the lessons that can be learned from them. It was a real pleasure to hear a bit more about uh, you know, how some of those activities were undertaken and mm -hmm. what we can actually learn from them and take away. Uh, so it's my pleasure to reflect today on some of the relationships between crises uh, such as COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and energy poverty and resilience. So, um, Many people have mentioned crisis. I'm just going back to the definition of crisis because in academia, we see kind of crisis in two ways. One of them is kind of the real effects of crisis when we talk about how we change our everyday practices and especially in terms of energy poverty, how we are affected by a different crisis in our everyday life. And the second one is the interpretation of crisis or crisis as a socio-political construct and uh, basically how public and policy discourses are developed uh, to, int to make different interpretations of crisis. So often we hear, for example, ab about blackouts. Often we hear how people in general are affected by crisis. And sometimes it feels like we are all affected in the same way. Nevertheless, if we go back to the kind of primary definition of even the word crisis, like in Greece, it's everything it, it, um, is uh, related to making decisions and sometimes very tough decisions. So crisis can be seen as a very detrimental moment, but it can also be seen as a moment that can actually help us reconfigure and renew some of the processes and the ways in which we live in our society. I'm not going to say a lot about how, for example, the COVID-19 has affected energy poverty because the previous speakers actually have said quite a few things and I agree with all of them. Uh, but what is interesting is when we talk, for example, about resilience, is that disadvantaged groups or vulnerable people enter the crisis not in the same uh, in the same way as all of us, but but they actually enter the crisis as what we call that lower resilience already. Uh, so we know that COVID nineteen as all previous crises, of course, we are not. This is not the first time that we live in a time of crisis, but in a way, each crisis exacerbates like all the existing inequalities and injustices in a way. So, uh, for example, we have statistics that show that um, job losses affected social cohesion. People on informal contracts were three times more likely to, do, to lose their jobs during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what is very interesting is the... The, the pandemic and the crisis really worsened the long-standing gender, race, age, and income inequalities as well. So basically, that social segregation has been really increased. 
Uh, and of course, that is a result of many, um, many processes as previous speakers, especially Lisa has mentioned them in terms of like postponing large infrastructural projects, uh, refocusing on, on medical issues and so on as it was uh, required. What is also interesting, and we know, especially with the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and the kind of um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also climate crisis, we don't live in a time of one crisis anymore, but it's actually we live in a time of multiple crises. And that kind of conjuncture of different crises uh, basically leads even to further um, as I said, worsening of existing socio-spatial injustices. But if we go back to the kind of that primary definition of crisis, it also um, it basically creates a situation in which we are faced by the decision-making processes and to make the right, the right decisions in terms of creating more resilient um, energy policies and energy systems. I'm saying this because in terms of governing crisis, uh, energy vulnerable people should not be expected to govern those crises. Uh, crises are governed by governments. So it's basically is the responsibility of our governments to create more resilient energy systems. We cannot expect the most vulnerable people in our society to become resilient is in energy systems that are not resilient themselves. So in order, to actually increase that resilience of vulnerable people, we need to think about the resilience of our energy system. And if anything, what we've been faced by is, a, is a, actually a situation that has, you know, governments that do not really have resilient energy systems. I mean, the thing here is also in terms of on systemic changes and it was really refreshing to hear some of the findings from the pilot projects because very often when we talk about energy vulnerability we kind of expect by uh, you know implementing one project uh, in specific context to make almost vulnerable people like superheroes. We expect to see like how much energy they saved or how much carbon they saved. But to be honest, in everyday life, it's mostly about improving the living conditions of those people because the, those people live in detrimental conditions and that should not be allowed in, in, in countries with developed economies to begin with. Um, so... I think it's very important to take into consideration some of the aspects or some of the existing injustices, as I mentioned, in terms of gender, because caring, uh, for example, has been seen as a very gendered issue so far. And during the COVID-19 situation, if anything, staying at home, um, the share of domestic chores has been really unequally distributed among different uh, household uh, members. We've been talking a lot about how to bring energy poverty and just and energy transitions, green energy transitions together. So it's very interesting and it's very promising to see that, uh, you know, the establishment of energy communities, for example, with all the support it, that it goes with it, to take into consideration some of those injustices and to manage somehow to include the most vulnerable people in, you know, in those energy communities. Uh, so far, and we have many studies that show that energy communities are still a middle class uh, project. Uh, so, and still, they are very much dominated by male members, uh, especially in terms of decision making. So if we would like to actually make those energy systems more resilient, and if we are very serious about addressing energy vulnerability as a strategic uh, aim and a strategic policy aim, we really need to actually really think holistically about changing energy systems and what we offer and how we engage and involve energy vulnerable people. I mean, often energy vulnerable people and households are addressed in a very much top down, um, top down uh, way. So it's good to see that we think how to include them uh, in the in the just 
and green energy transition by installing solar panels. And that was fascinating. And I was really glad to hear that some of the previous speakers actually talked about well-being and people being happy about you know having those solar panels installed. It's very important to think about the maintenance of those solar panels because we have uh, many pilot uh, projects in which, for example, uh, perfect solar panels were installed and perfect technologies were implemented, but the maintenance was not there to think about those people after the end of the project. So who is going to maintain those solar panels? Uh, where can people go to ask for some advice? And I was really happy to hear that, for example, like the case study in Spain mentioned that they have already established a one-stop shop where people can go even afterwards to hear something more about, uh, you know, um, the engagement with the technology. So also when we think about the most vulnerable people, I think it's um, it's very important to shift the emphasis from the individual survival techniques onto like more collective and community level mitigating activities. Uh, activities with climate change, especially what is important. We talk a lot about, for example, heat islands, and some of the most vulnerable people actually live in neighborhoods that are in the middle of those heat islands. So we need to think about urban planning and how to protect those houses and buildings not to be affected by urban planning decision-making that can actually may worsen the situation of, of the housing. And here we talk about blue infrastructures, green infrastructures, and so on. And I, I already mentioned the importance of involving um, energy vulnerable people in the creation and the functioning of, for example, energy communities, different types of energy communities as defined by the, by the directives of the, of, the European, um, of the European Union. So I'm not going to talk more because I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to the panel and all the questions that mm. you sent to us as well. But thank you for your attention. And I'm really, really um, happy to hear more um, about, uh, about the project and to discuss the questions further. Thank you very much, Johannes, for inviting me once again. Thank you, Saskia, for a very interesting presentation. I, I've taken many notes here. I, I think I could just like ask and we would not have a panel, but I think we should bring everyone on board and, and let's have a, a discussion um, with all of us. So let's let's bring back um, uh, Andre, Anna, Tudor and Ivan to the screen as well. So we're just waiting for them. I hope we soon can see one another. I can see all of them. So I think we should actually start um, since you brought up this Aska with a one uh, stop shop that Anna mentioned in her presentation. I think maybe Anna, you can uh, explain a bit more, share a bit about this and how it has been effective for your agency. So you didn't mention so much, but uh, elaborate a bit well, more. Well, we, <laughs> we had uh, two different types of one-stop shop. So we have uh, been working in one um, that it was in charge of doing technical, administrative and financial studies of uh, energy measure in residential buildings where we have vulnerable families, of course. So um, we have um, go uh, to the um, commu homeowners uh, community association meetings mm. uh, to present uh, the, the measure that we detected that was most cost effective. It was quite challenging to involve those uh, vulnerable situation uh, in the in, in this in renovation wave, you see. So, mm, and yeah. that uh, with the recovery funds, um, I see them as an opportunity because uh, the grants that they are uh, having uh, mm. available include 100 percentage grant for vulnerable families. So this means that uh, these uh, families that are inside a building where want to go with this can mm. afford uh, the energy renovation process without not upfront payments because we also have the possibility of uh, having this grant with um, um, the, the reimbursement of the grants uh, at the beginning. Mm. So that is quite really good. 
but uh, now we have moved on to a different so now that we have the identification of these 300, 300 uh, buildings uh, with the energy studies now yeah. we have moved on to a different type of uh, assistance so now we are having like one stop shop uh, to um, answer some doubts about the the specific programs so mm. i think right now in the region we we have the scenario ready for the energy renovation but mm. it is going to be a challenge because the the recovery funds has a short period of time to be executed, as I mentioned. Yeah. So that is what we try to agilize with the one-stop shop to reduce mm. the administrative problems. I was just going then to ask if any of the other partners have worked similarly or 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 working in another way to to do, to combat similar. I'm just yeah, Ivan. Yes, uh, as far as I'm, we are concerned, um, as I said, we have uh, we have established, say, um, basic level of one-stop shop uh, towards citizens, uh, so all citizens, not only energy poor citizens, uh, where we advise them on on the possibilities to uh, make their homes. Uh, more energy efficient and how to use renewable energy sources. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, so this activity uh, is ongoing for three and a half years now. And uh, we have, as I said, uh, organized it in, in uh, all our co-funding cities. Uh, furthermore, uh, throughout uh, the duration of the project, uh, we were also working on uh some new ideas for for the, the social housing and energy poor household uh city of Arizon is one of the uh few examples in croatia which has organized social housing multi-apartment social housing uh mm -hmm. and uh we have been able to uh let's say uh, submit the application project application on two uh, projects where we want to uh a address uh, uh, <clears throat> installation of, of uh, PV panels on this uh, social housing, uh, mm -hmm. along with uh, the formation of a kind of energy community, uh, which is which is something we also work on, but um, the legal framework does not permit us to go uh, much further. We are still waiting for some bylaws to help us uh, in, in this direction. Mm. And recently we also submitted one, one um, Horizon Europe project uh, where we also target uh, social housing and uh, how the demand response with uh, energy communities and other uh, renewable energy can help mm. also reduce uh the bills of, of these citizens these are uh you know these are the activities which do not which uh may not uh, have uh you know positive results but uh, we definitely uh know the direction we definitely want yeah. know uh what we want uh when we apply for for a certain project Mm. And uh, yeah, uh, as I said, we are uh, trying to work on, on several facets of, of uh, several dimensions of uh, helping both citizens, but also energy poor citizens as a set of all citizens. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, to move on to another question here. Like since our call of this project, uh, the fifth call is about the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course we have to have changed playing field since since uh, this extension was approved with the with the war in Ukraine, for instance, which we, we we all are seeing increasing our energy prices. But but also during the pandemic, as you, we all have presented today, we could all already see the increased vulnerability. So I'm, I'm just going to ask all of you here what during the two and a half years uh, since the first pandemic lockdowns in Europe, what have you learned about energy poverty during this time? What what have you seen as like what are the learnings for, from the past two and a half years? Uh, maybe Tudor. Uh, thank you, Johannes. Indeed, a very interesting question and a very difficult one. Uh, it depends how we uh, address it. If we address it mm. at local level, uh, regional level, or national level. 
Uh, of course, at, at local level, we discussed with the, our most uh, proximate uh, encounter. At local level, we, we discovered that the energy retrofitting the projects for buildings uh, of residents and also public buildings are most important than ever because uh, we have seen and we have been shocked by the energy prices. For example, a school has seen a tenfold increase in their energy bills. Uh, of course, it was not normal to have uh, 10 times the, the increase of bills, you know, not doubled, not tripled, but even 10 times. And this has put a lot of uh, uh, pressure on the budgets of municipalities, of schools, and uh, even on national governments who had to supply with this funding. So uh, this this was quite a, quite a challenge that I don't think uh, anyone was quite prepared for it. We, we had the, the projects for retrofitting of buildings, which went well and uh, the, the citizens felt it directly. But for some of the public schools, we were not prepared at the time and uh, that was the situation. Mm -hmm. Then at regional level uh, as well, I, I, uh, I think the managing authorities discovered that they need to push more uh, the energy uh, agenda forward and with concrete uh, calls for, uh, for projects. Uh, in this direction, maybe mm. even uh, directed from other priorities to this uh, uh, priority, uh, yeah. uh, energy saving. Um, we, so it's, it's, it's quite a complex uh, question. Uh, I'm not going yeah. to go into the geopolitical aspect because it's, uh, it's not so relevant. We are very close to Ukraine as Romania, and uh, we, we have sort of a uh, yeah, relation uh, geopolitical relation they also have some own resources but we were not prepared to use them uh, wisely we have uh, yeah. black sea some reserves but uh, we were not uh, very prepared so yeah. i won't go for the uh, so tudor I, I was also thinking like when you were, were were mentioning this it just came to my mind like uh, about what who is vulnerable really like have you have you seen an increased number of, like um, Nordrego is located in Sweden and we haven't discussed energy and energy consumption as much here as ever before. Like we just had an election and it was like one of the big questions discussed because generally speaking, that is not a topic discussed so much. I'm not saying we don't have energy poverty in Sweden. We never have had that, but it has not been as discussed now, but now we're discussing it in all of Europe. So have the pandemic or all these like crises that are appearing, uh, how do we track who is vulnerable? How do we know who's energy poor? How, how do you work with that? Uh, any reflections? Maybe I can bring in Saska. Have you, have you reflected upon like who is energy poor when the context is changing? Yeah, I, I mean, it depends whether we, I mean, we, we are actually talking about in a, in a time of crisis, like energy mm. poverty in a time of crisis or just like in general, um, in general like situations but the thing is i think it depends on the context uh, we always say that the energy union or the energy commission has they have not provided a you know a uniform definition but mm. actually there are some recommendations in terms of like specific indicators that can be used mm -hmm. um, to identify uh, who might be energy vulnerable and um, the definition and the recommendation is quite broad and I think that's a good thing because it depends on the context and it gives actually member states some freedom to assess their own situation. So in terms of who is energy vulnerable, we always go back to the kind of uh, to the basics in terms of mm -hmm. like who doesn't have or which households don't have access to essential energy services. And it can be heating, it can be lighting, it can be actually access to the internet because mm. with this kind of work online, and especially we, we talk about families with children, everything is about that access to the, to the internet and working online. So mm. all those who do not actually have access to those kind of necessary energy services should be taken into consideration. But as I said, some people and some households are affected more, some households are affected less. Mm -hmm. We then go back to some of the basic indicators in terms of like well-recorded um, well 
injustices and in terms, for example, families with children, but also single parent families, uh, families of elderly with elderly members, uh, or like pensioners who uh, who might be uh, vulnerable people with chronic um, medical, for example, um, you know, uh, illness uh, like with chronic illnesses and so um, and so on. So we can go back back to that people in social housing were already mentioned mm. but also we need to go back also to some kind of like issues around ethnicity for example like who is the deserving and who is the non-deserving than uh, vulnerable and we need to open up discussions in terms of like race and, uh, and ethnicity as well here and to take into consideration those issues for example we have um, we have studies that show that, for example, um, people who belong to different um, ethnic uh, communities or mm. um, religious communities might be more excluded for just energy transitions. So we need to rethink some of those issues um, issues as well. Um, yes, that would be my... Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I was just... Um, thinking when you were saying like the energy poverty, we know that needs it, in in one way it's good, it's broad because you need to contextually adapt it to the to the national, the regional, or even local context. But I just want to open this question up to all the partners because when we talk about energy poverty in a broader sense, how do we identify energy poverty locally, and how, do we have the tools needed to target the energy poor households when we have identified them? Um, anyone who wants to to answer that question. We have discussed uh, Ivan. Um, well, uh, as I said uh, during the project uh, and, and uh, during the presentations, obviously um, people living in energy poverty um, rely very much on the local uh, stakeholders because they are the closest one. Uh, they usually have uh, some kind of programs, social affairs, uh, services programs that uh, can help them. Uh, people know other people. So um, in general, we think uh, that, uh, you know, this, this personal uh, or in-person meetings are uh, the most beneficial ones, although many people also avoid such kind of uh, encounters. Uh, certain people uh, do not want to communicate, certain people do not feel comf comfortable to, to discuss the situation. So uh, in general, uh, but if you go to the level above or even to the national level, then they are definitely lost. Uh, they can know something about the national programs, but yeah. in the end, they can back. They come back to the local uh, stakeholders and talk to them, discuss uh, about the, the opportunities or possibilities from these uh, programs. So uh, we have also learned a lot about uh, those people, as, as I mentioned, for, presentation about you know their um, other problems which are not uh, you know mainly or uh, exclusively uh, related to, to, to energy uh, Sashka mentioned uh, also the health issues and other issues so yeah. uh, yes we have seen another side of the medal as well uh, so uh, but in general I think uh, local policy instruments and maybe uh, you know transferring national uh, or as much as possible transferring national instruments to local level is something that I would always uh, recommend to, to, to anybody. Mm. I see that Anna and Saskia raised both their hands. I, can't, I don't know who was first. Uh, was it Anna? Okay, Anna, you go ahead. It was Saska, but it's okay. <laughs> well, um, I just wanted to add that, that we don't we don't know exactly what are the indicators uh, to to know what we can consider the energy poverty um, person here in Extremadura because we are more involved in the energy side, not in the in the in this other part. But uh, we can say that 
we have a lot of families living in the social housing stock. And I guess that, that these people are definitely in this situation because they cannot even afford the, the rent. And as you saw, when you came to Extremadura in our last interregional event, they don't have an energy poverty. They have a poverty in any sense. Mm. So for them, energy is not important. They, they don't have even the, the norm, their normal living conditions. So they have other, as Asa said, they have other problems other than the energy poverty. So if we go to another level, we have also vulnerable families, as I said, uh, in, mm. inside other buildings that are more difficult to get to because we, we cannot, or they are more difficult to be identified. But mm. uh, these uh, recovery funds, for example, they define these uh, vulnerable families, the families that um, their uh, incomes are lower than X. You know, so that is the way they measure this energy poverty. It's not energy poverty, it's a living condition or vulnerable situation, they call it. Mm. And they this vulnerable situation could grant the 100 or the 90% of the grants. Mm. So maybe another thing that Ivan said, which I find really interesting, are the people that are accessing to uh, energy uh, grants or uh, bonus. That could be another way to, to address that. Yeah. But definitely, we have a lot of families in vulnerable situation that are really in an energy poverty situation because the other ones, maybe they are not even in an energy, energy poverty situation. They are in poverty yeah. like, like that. So that is what I wanted to, to yeah. add on top of it. I, I will let Saskia in here since you raised your hand as well. Thank you. I mean, absolutely great. Uh, great reflections. Um, I would just also say that if we actually establish some basic principles in terms, for example, how we establish energy communities mm -hmm. or how we deal with the implementation of national policies, for example, if we say that 20% of the membership of energy you know, communities should be with actually um, you know, socially vulnerable people, I don't think we will have to go house to house to identify who is vulnerable and to single out people and to actually, you know, creating a whole situation about blaming and responsabilization of those people, but we can make it a policy to target social inequalities in, in our societies. So that's mm -hmm. why when I said, like, when we think about the energy, the green energy transition, we need to think about those inherited inequalities as well. Yeah. So, because we still, as I said, especially we have companies now that organize energy communities uh, and still somehow we forget about some of the basic principles of social responsibility or the responsibility towards specific communities. So if we make, and if we embed those principles, we're not going to have a, a discussion in terms of like singling out people who might struggle in their everyday life. Mm. Thank you, Saskia. I think that it will be the final words for this panel discussion. Uh, we don't have, we're running out of time and, and uh, it has been very interesting to hear all your perspectives, all the lessons learned from the Social Green Partners. And what I take away mainly from, from, from your presentation, Saskia, was also this, uh, energy systems is the responsibility of the governments in all of this. Like it, it shouldn't go down to the individual. We, we need to to find ways to create more resilient energy system at the first place, so we are less vulnerable. And don't forget about the vulnerable groups when we when we work with energy communities, for instance. Uh, so thank you all all all, all uh, partners all, and Saska for for this event. And and I will just bring back my colleague Lisa to this to the stage. What do you, how do you find this event? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been fantastic to hear from all of you and see you all again. Um, and it does seem like these interregional discussions should definitely continue. And um, hopefully we can meet again to discuss some of these um, very quick moving also issues um, as we see new, new yeah. plans arising from the EU, the, the repower um, plan that's coming up as well. And I think there's so much to discuss here. So uh, thank you all for, for your time and um, Hopefully we can continue some of these yeah. discussions in the future. And we hope you all get a, a, a good day and a good work week. So see you again soon and thank you very much.